Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ryan Gapsky, and I'm the speaker's director of the William F. Buckley Jr. Program at Yale. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to our firing line debate on common good conservatism. Before I introduce our guests, I'd like to say a few words about the Buckley Program. The William F. Buckley Program is an organization dedicated to promoting intellectual diversity and open political discussion at Yale. We have hosted lectures, dinner seminars, firing line debates, and an annual conference every year since 2011. Our over 400 Buckley Fellows have a wide range of political beliefs, but they all stand united against the formation of a liberal-only echo chamber on campus. By providing Yale students with a forum to engage meaningfully with serious conservative thought, the Buckley Program has become an institution on Yale's campus and a symbol for a more open and more representative political atmosphere. Especially at a university where the mission is the cultivation and creation of new knowledge, Buckley Fellows believe that all perspectives must be heard and examined in good faith. You can learn more about the program and how to become a fellow on our website at buckleyprogram.com. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator and two speakers for today's debate. Dr. Gregory Collins, our moderator, is a lecturer in the Department of Political Science and Program on Ethics, Politics, and Economics. His book on Edmund Burke's economic thought, titled, Com titled Commerce and Manners in Edmund Burke's Political Economy, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2020. Greg's scholarly and teaching interests include the history of political thought, the ph philosophical and ethical implications of political economy, American political development, constitutional theory and practice, and the political theory of abolition. Josh Hammer is opinion editor of Newsweek, a research fellow with the Edmund Burke Foundation, counsel and policy advisor for the Internet Accountability Project, a syndicated columnist through Creators, and a contributing editor for Anchoring Truths. A frequent pundit and essayist on political, legal, and cultural issues, Josh is a constitutional attorney by training and the co-host of two podcasts, Newsweek's The Debate and the Edmund Burke Foundation's NatCon Squad. An outspoken conservative, Josh opines on conservative intellectual trends, contemporary, do contemporary domestic and foreign policy debates, constitutional and legal issues, and the intersection of law, politics, and culture. He has been published by many leading outlets and has also had legal scholarship published by the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy and the University of St. Thomas Law Journal. Mr. Hammer will be debating in the affirmative for today's debate. Dan McLaughlin is a senior writer at National Review Online and a fellow at National Review Institute. He was formerly an attorney practicing securities and commercial litigation in New York City, a contributing editor for Red State, columnist at the, Federal, at the Federalist and the New Ledger, and a baseball blogger at baseballcrank.com, bostonsportsguy.com, the Providence Journal Online, and a contributor to the Command Post. His writings on politics, baseball, and law have appeared in numerous other newspapers, magazines, websites, and legal journals. Mr. McLaughlin will be arguing in the negative for today's debate. Um, regarding the format of the debate, I'll turn it over to Professor Collins for some brief opening remarks, and then each of our guests will begin with five-minute opening statements, after which they will both have two minutes each to respond. I'll turn it over to Professor Collins to moderate, and then he'll ask some of his own questions and take some, take some from the audience. If you're interested in asking a question, please raise your hand, and we'll get this mic over to you. Uh, and lastly, we'll conclude with two minutes uh, of closing remarks from each speaker and wrap it up by 5.30 p.m. With that, please join me in welcoming our guests to Yale and to the Buckley Program. Thank you uh, for that introdu introduction. Uh, can you hear me from the back? Or should I take my mask off? Or can you hear me well? Um, yes, yeah, you can see my bright, smiling face. Um, but uh, welcome to uh, today's debate. Um, to cut to the chase, uh, this debate on the meaning of conservatism, whether it is oriented towards a common good or not, uh, in my judgment, has been probably the defining de debate uh, among conservative intellectual thought the past few years, three, four, five years. Um, and it has uh, challenged really many of the presuppositions of conservatism in particular, it's libertarian and classical liberal strands uh, that have emerged and were popularized by Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek and other classical uh, liberal thinkers. Uh, and these two thinkers here have been at the forefront of this debate uh, and have eloquently uh, defended different forms of conservatism, common good conservatism, and not. Uh, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to hearing them articulate their thoughts on this uh, defining, defining debate um, that has uh, characterized conservative um, intellectual uh, discussion in the past five years or so. Uh, so with that, I'll open up to uh, opening statements. Okay, great. Uh, so 
little bit of time, 4.38. Okay, so trying to keep a rough track of time here. So thank you guys so much for having me. Really my first time on Yale's campus, kind of surprisingly, I didn't grow up terribly far from here, but I have not had an opportunity to be here before. It's obviously a beautiful campus. I went to Duke for undergrad, so I think we kind of, we kind of sort of modeled our campus after y'all, so it's kind of cool to see the original version here. Great to be here with Dan. I think we overlapped a little bit blogging at Red State way back in the day when Eric Erickson was editing there, so it's kind of fun to reprise that here for y'all. Um, so look, I, you know, the terminology here, we can, we can be a little fast and loose with it. The way we phrase it here today is common good conservatism. To me, I kind of use that term in my own line of work somewhat synonymously or interchangeably with national conservatism, which is the pre precise formulation I think most closely identifiable with the Emin Burke Foundation, where my research fellow, where Yoram Hazoni is, is the chairman. Um, what, what this basically gets down to um, is whether or not, from my perspective, a more kind of forward-facing, muscular, more robust form of conservative governance is needed. And my basic contention here is twofold. And I'll try to do this extremely quickly because our time here in opening remarks is obviously very limited. But my basic contention, we'll tease this out in Q&A, is that the modern quote unquote conservative movement in America, to the extent that's really existed in kind of the post-war formulation, going back obviously to God and Man and Yale, with Buckley himself and the founding of National Review, the Heritage Foundation, kind of the notion of the so-called fusionist consensus that Frank Meyer famously promulgated, this kind of fusing together of kind of uh, economic laissez-faire with a privately held kind of social, moral, or cultural traditionalism. My contention is that this has failed at worst or simply been unsuccessful to deliver actually tangibly conservative results at best. And likewise, the, the cor natural corollary of that claim is that it has failed, at least in part, because it has not actually embraced conservatism, but it, because it has actually embraced a form of right-leaning liberalism, as the professor alluded to just now. So real quickly, I think anywhere you look around, it is pretty manifestly clear to me that the modern conservative movement has failed. You can basically take virtually any issue. Um, obviously, we're both lawyers. I mean, kind of, uh, you know, abortion, Roe versus Wade, obviously being a paradigmatic example here, of course. You know, uh, 50 years after Roe versus Wade, or 49 years to be precise, uh, you know, we'll see, what, we'll see what the court does in the, in the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health case that comes in June, to, suffice to say, until now. That case obviously remains, quote unquote, good law of the US Supreme Court. We have a wide open border where some of the most murderous transnational cartels in, in, the, in the world control large swaths of that border. There was fentanyl, there were drugs ruining in here. And all of, the, all of these problems, you've kind of, I mean, I, I, I don't know how many of y'all are from the Midwest or you've driven around the Midwest, or you've driven around Ohio. I went to law school in Chicago. I've done the drive from New York to Chicago numerous times. I've actually stayed in Toledo, Ohio. I spent a good amount of time in Ohio, Indiana, places like that. You just have to drive around there. You literally need to open your eyes to see what the neoliberal consensus has done in America. The notion, of course, to kind of quote a, a person from the George W. Bush White House, who famously said, you know, potato chips, computer chips, what's the difference? What difference does it make? This notion that we are pursuing kind of economic GDP fetishization, economic efficiency as kind of an end unto itself has torn asunder the American heartland. It has torn asunder America's very basic ability to maintain our supply chains, to maintain our economic integrity, and ultimately, of course, as we saw at the beginning of COVID with respect to kind of PPE, our very kind of economic and national security vitality. We have become utterly dependent on our foremost, our arch geopolitical rival, of course, the Communist Party of China, for our very kind of economic security. And they have done so because they have subscribed to an overly ideological, overly liberalized conception of conservatism that pursues the ruling class's globalist elite's ends at the expense of the American people themselves, whether it's crime, whether it's immigration, whether it's economics and so forth here. And again, I think we have done so because we have mistaken what should have been kind of time and place, time, place and manner policies, the likes of which kind of, you know, uh, ascended kind of President Reagan to office in 1980, the Reagan Bush campaign in 84. We have mistaken policies, whether supply side tax cutting, de deregulation, things like that. We've mistaken policies for principles. Our conservative principles to me are effectively as follows. They are pursuing substantive justice, the notion that you render good to those who deserve good and harm to those who deserve harm, human flourishing, kind of the Aristotelian or classical formulation, and of course, ultimately getting at the common good of the whole, the common good where kind of nation, sub, uh, uh, sub, subsidiary states like actual states themselves, families, communities, and, and ultimately individuals are all operating in harmonious fashion in, in something that is greater than simple kind of individual preference aggregation. So I think we have totally just mistaken what are the ultimate goals of politics from a right of center perspective in kind of this overly liberalized format. And we have done so, I think, in, 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 to, to a large extent by fetishizing GDP and things of that nature. So um, for the sake of time, I'll just cut off there. And, yeah. well, it is, 
It is good to be here. It is. I feel that I am actually rather at home getting to debate um, a defense of the American conservative tradition uh, against a representative of the uh, corporate mainstream media. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the 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 word that you didn't hear uh, in Josh's opening, and I think is is really gets to so much of the crux of this debate is liberty. Uh, and and uh, you know, the American conservative tradition, a national conservatism must consider what its nation is. And the classical liberal principles, uh, the focus on liberty, are essential and have been essential from the very beginning to what is distinctively American. I mean, I, I think it is worth considering again the most famous sentence in American history. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, and that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and institute new government. You know, it's, those words, we're still quoting them uh, 246 years after they were written, because the idea of liberty is so powerful in America and so deeply embedded in American culture and also in American conservatism. You know, we actually, on the question of the relative role of liberty in the common good, and certainly the common good in, in some general sense, uh, you know, the conservative traditional virtues of tradition, order, authority, uh, are all parts of the American conservative tradition, but uh, you know, we actually had kind of an experiment, if you will, a political science experiment here in the last two years in the United States um, of what would happen if you had a crisis that required people on the one hand to consider, you know, both the utilitarian version of the greater good, but also the uh, moral and virtue based idea of the common good of individuals being asked to sacrifice for the greater good. And that, of course, is the pandemic. Right? We were all asked to submit to all sorts of government authority in the name of the common good. And you know those are reasonable requests at a general level, and certainly many people considered them reasonable. But if you looked around at the American right over the past two years, broadly speaking, the center right, right, conservatives, libertarians, republicans, independents, all of that, I think it is fairly safe to say that their instinctive response here was not, well, tread on me a little bit. Uh, what you saw instead was a great flourishing of uh, you know, the same sort of spirit that we saw, say, in the Tea Party movement uh, 12 years ago, which is a, an instinctive desire for liberty, not only liberty of the individual, but also what it comes with in the conservative vision, which is liberty of the community, right? Liberty of the church, liberty of, of your businesses, liberty of uh, the family. And so, you know, conservatism is not an atomized libertarian vision of just the individual, right? It, it recognizes the role of, you know, uh, Burke's little platoons in society, but a fundamentally American version of conservatism uh, sees that, that role of individual liberty with all of those things that are in right there in that first sentence in the Declaration of Independence, right? The inalienable individual rights, uh, the origin of those rights in our creation by God, uh, the fact that those rights include individual liberty and the right to pursue your own vision of the good, um, and the idea that, that governments are democratic and based in the consent of the people uh, because we trust the people, uh, we trust you know, the broadest distribution of power in society as the most effective safeguard of those individual rights. And you know, I, I would say that, that, that one of the things that separates, I think, the, what I view as you know, Reaganite conservatism, movement conservatism, Buckley conservatism, um, is a view of process as well, that process matters, rules matter, systems matter, and it's not just the substantive good. The substantive good is very important, but how we go about making decisions is enormously important. You know, we have a divide between, um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up a little bit here because I think we can get into some of this, but you know, there's a fundamental divide between say conservatives and progressives. And I think that, that you know, this focus on kind of a guided vision of the collective 
you know, a guided vision of the common good puts us a little bit away from the conservative position. The conservative position, as I see it, on our system um, <coughs> is that you know, the progressive vision is one of essentially um, supervised democracy, right? The idea that, that you get everybody in, everybody has their say, but then the people at the top of the system fundamentally decide which things are consistent with their principles and are allowed to happen and which are not. Right? What, what words are allowed to be spoken and what are not. Uh, whereas the conservative idea, the, you know, the, the fusionist conservative movement idea is fundamentally that the process matters and we have a series of a deliberative process. We have a lot of speed bumps in the road before the people can finally be heard. But once they get over all of those, once they build a consensus, once they put rules in place, uh, that those are the law and that those are at the end point of the deliberations of the people, those are, that is the vision of the common good that, that, uh, that governs the country. I mean, I, I guess what I would ask Josh is, is, you know, who decides what the common good is? Two minute rebuttal. <clears throat> All right, um, so a lot to unpack there, obviously. Uh, I'm sure we'll get into more of this in Q&A. Um, so look, I think my side, broadly speaking, of this debate, you know, the so-called new right, which by the way is a term I don't particularly like. Um, I actually was watching, of all things, a, uh, a documentary. Uh, you know, I don't know if you all have seen Get Me Roger Stone on Netflix, a documentary about Roger Stone. Way back when, when Stone became president of college Republicans or young Republicans back in the 70s, they were called the new right. So you know, these terms always change and mean nothing. But my side of this broader debate, what we now call the so-called new right, I think we understand that liberty is a good. What we object to is the notion that liberty should be, should be, or at least historically has been over the past 60, 70 years, I think exalted, placed on a pedestal as the sole and unambiguous good that defines who we are as Americans and who we are as conservatives in particular. That is, that's not conservatism as I recognize it. That is, that is libertarianism at best is an overly liberalized version of conservatism. What I subscribe to is a very basic notion, I mean, how Russell Kirk would have formulated, of course, is order to liberty. And my basic contention is that if you look at kind of the intellectual and historical genealogy of the post-fusionist post Frank Meyer um, you know, consensus over the past 60, 70 years, we have erred way, way, way too much on the side of liberty. By the time now, when you look what's actually happening in America with family breakdown, with skyrocketing out of wedlock childbirth, obviously, with, you know, with record-breaking opioid over deaths, with a ruling class that is so completely untethered from the interests of, of, the, of the common man, I think it is time to basically affirmatively legislate on behalf of the common good. And what that means is that legislators, administrators in Article 2, and, and yes, judges in Article 3, that's a separate side debate, should in their day-to-day -day functions pursue their constitutional actions within their own kind of independent constitutional spheres of influence with a mind to the common wheel, with an eye, with an eye towards solidarity, cohesion, ultimately, of course, national unity, and at the expense of idi idiosyncratic notions of individual autonomy. Now, look, on the COVID thing in particular, look, I flew up here today, obviously, you know, a judge did a very brave and heroic thing and yesterday yesterday kudos to her it was wonderful to kind of breathe without this stupid freaking face diaper on i love that but it, it is possible to arrive at that conclusion as myself my friends like Saurabh Amari and many others have done on fundamentally common good oriented paradigms um, it's possible, of course, to arrive at the opposite conclusion, too. The common good is simply a framework for analysis. It's an analytical framework. It does not decisively answer every single minutia of policy detail here. But th the point here is that if COVID had been a massively fatal disease, if we're talking about like a 15, 20% fatality rate, if you catch this thing, and it's spreading like wildfire, then, then that be, that's a pretty freaking strong empirical case that the common good is best preserved by very draconian lockdowns, mandates, whatever. That was not the case. COVID obviously was less lethal in many respects, according to some data I've seen than, than the common flu. Certainly I saw data from the Bank of England, just that was the case back in England. The COVID vaccines are kind of infamously not, you know, inefficacious, they're not effective at all. So it ultimately gets down to an empirical question to say nothing obviously of how the ruling class and the regime has manipulated the COVID regime from lockdowns, mandates and mass and all of that to basically err on the side of the Davos laptop class that can work from home and they get along well and the small business owners, well, they're crap out of luck. So there's, there's very much kind of an element of class warfare going on in COVID as well. So I kind of arrive at all those conclusions through kind of a, a common good analytical lens, not through kind of a necessarily kind of, you know, don't tread on me, kind of, uh, you know, get off my lawn, Clint Eastwood lens. Two minutes. You know, the, the other thing that I would, I would add to this debate here is I think that the, you know, 
conservatism, part of conservatism uh, requires us to think historically, right? We have to think about uh, how, how things have developed over time, how our institutions, how our ideas have developed over time. Um, I would make two points about that. One here is that, first of all, you know, when we talk about uh, the American founding, um, you know, and, and the durability of its ideas, uh, you know, I, I think if you look at the founding of the Republican Party in that era, right, the, what some historians even would call our second founding, I think the, the ideas of liberty, of uh, the dignity of free labor, of a kind of Lockean property rights uh, concept um, was very much it was very much central to to why Lincoln uh, and his generation uh, you know came up with their vision their vision which which I think is is still very vital and important today to uh, to the conservative movement but I would also I would dispute Josh's view that you know that kind of the conservative movement of Reagan and Buckley was somehow a you know, a terrible failure for the country. I think, I think as conservatives, we have to be realistic, first of all, about the fact um, that, you know, not every problem is going to be solved all at once. You're always going to set out to solve more things than you were able to solve. Uh, and also that victories won today are not always won forever. Every victory needs to be rewon in every generation. Um, but I think if you look back at the record, if you look back at where the country stood from, you know, the 50s through the 70s, um, politically we have come a very, very long way. Uh, now, part of that is a matter of partisan politics, and obviously, uh, partisan politics is only part of the story because partisan politics gets you power, uh, and then you still have to ask what you did with power. But fundamentally, partisan politics is important because it rests on persuasion of the voters, and you know. The New Deal era, basically from the 30s through the 70s, uh, there was an enormous top to bottom democratic control uh, of state legislatures, of Congress. Um, all of that fell away. The Democrats ran Congress for 40 years. When, when Ronald Reagan ran for president, the electorate voter registration was something like 15 points more Democratic than Republican. Um, so you had a shift in that. Secondly, I think, you know, if you look at one of, one of, I think, Josh's complaints about elites is this kind of march through the institutions of the progressives. But there is no area in which uh, conservatives have been more successful in marching through the institutions than in the courts and in the legal academy. Uh, if you look at the Federalist Society, if you look at the originalist movement, um, and, uh, you know, look, we will have a test of Roe versus Wade very soon. Um, but, you know, it is worth considering that, you know, even in the mid-1980s, there were two uh, justices on the court who were against Roe, um, even as recently as, uh, you know, and politics matters, even as recently as Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992, which upheld Roe, uh, seven of the nine justices on the Supreme Court had been confirmed by a Democratic Senate. Uh, and so the building of a political body that was more than just the head in the White House uh, has been en enormously important. I think if you look at um, you know, where we stand, where we stand in the Second Amendment, for example, the, uh, the right of gun ownership is enormously far advanced today from where it was in the 1970s. Uh, street crime uh, is back. That is a classic example of a battle that needs to be won more than once. Um, but the, the dramatic changes in the 1990s, uh, after decades of urban decay, um, you know, the media landscape, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, up until the end of the Fairness Doctrine in 1987, it was practically impossible to find conservative media uh, of the sort that, that are all over the place today. Um, you know, and that's even besides when we consider the Cold War uh, and the massive changes, you know, the end of enormous progressive tax rates. So I think, I think when you look back at what the conservative movement as such accomplished over that period of time, I think it was actually wildly successful. It was not successful at doing everything. Uh, and, you know, it did not leave uh, everything, it, it, it left things to be done by the next generation. But I think it was an enormously uh, successful movement. And, you know, look, as conservatives, principles are a compass, not a straitjacket, right? They, they, they guide us forward. So, of course, we need to reevaluate our strategies, our particular issue orientation uh, from each generation to the next. But uh, I, I do not think that, that, that we need to sort of throw out our, 
our guiding principles and our guiding framework. And I certainly do not think that, that it is productive for us to look at economic liberty, at free markets, and think that, that you know, the, the exigencies of today demand a heavier hand from government uh, you know, in, in, in rejecting the, those kinds of liberties. Because frankly, you know, what we've seen over and over again is that when you know, we invite government in to do that, it never leaves. I thank you for those powerful comments um, and uh, uh, remarks. Um, allow me to pose a few questions that I have based on your comments here today, your, your previous work, uh, and then we'll open to the audience. Um, I read nothing into these. I'm a moderator, I'm a neutral arbiter uh, in my position right now. Um, uh, Josh, I, I, forgive me um, if I'm wrong, but I don't know if you defined uh, answered Dan's uh, question about who defines common good conservatism. Literally speaking, is it legislators in Congress? Is it judges? You seem, judges seem to be one aspect of um, uh, that answer based on your writings. Um, if so, then how, does that, how can you reconcile that with a populist strand in national conservatism? It should be populists themselves who define the common good. Um, you've done some uh, scholarly work on how we understand the, that phrase, the common good, dur during the founding era. Um, that seems to lean on the uh, ideas of the founding fathers, we went through the uh, convention debates and so on. Um, so precisely, who is defining the common good? Um, that's my first question. Um, second question, in terms of the common good, progressives, of course, also have a vision of a common good. right? And in fact, correct me if I'm wrong, a progressive liberal, dare I say Marxist, critique of neoliberalism, free market capitalism, free Mil Milton Friedmanite and Hayekian thinking, does it not overlap to some, some extent with uh, what you're suggesting. If so, then, I guess the implications are politically, can a common good conservative align themselves with some of the interests of, of the progressive left? Um, or qualitatively, are there some distinctions um, that should remain um, uh, separate between a progressive conception of co the common good and a uh, national conservative conception of the common good? Um, final point for you. To what extent are the, do the social pathologies that you outlined, appropriately outlined, are they extent of too much economic <coughs> liberty, as we say today, or not enough economic liberty? So to put my libertarian, classical liberal, Milton Friedman, Hayekian cap on, well, social pathologies, unemployment, breakdown of the family, do they not impact, or were they not impacted in some way by excessive regulations, excessive um, uh, overly generous unemployment benefits, social insurance programs, and so on, the, the, the arguments that we're familiar with. In that sense, is not market capitalism not a cause of, but actually it's a possible uh, remedy uh, to mitigate the, uh, social, some of the social, social pathologies uh, that you mentioned. Um, uh, for Dan, uh, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead, yeah. yeah. I have questions for you, but yeah. Uh, okay, I'll yeah. try to <laughs> remember all that. It's a lot to take in, obviously. Um, okay, so your first question, who defines the common good. Um, I think that's um, I, I think that's, I think that's somewhat of a straw man with all due respect. I think that's and in, in, in no point do I think that anyone has to singularly kind of come down and kind of Moses from from Sinai with a tablet's fashion and say this is the common good. I mean obviously, you know, I, I for, for, on that point though, I mean everyone who has their own kind of in, their own individual re religious faith or kind of ethical tradition will have his or her own conception of the common good. My claim is merely that every constitutional actor in our government and here obviously in America we have both national and state level actors, we have kind of Article One, Article Two, Article Three, congressional, executive branch, and judicial actors. They all, with, within their well delineated kind of separation of powers, checks and balances, kind of curtailed spheres of constitutional action, should be pursuing their individual roles with an eye to the common good. So, so a lawyer for a for a United States senator should be advancing legislation, you know, both from a policy making and kind of a, an analytical perspective of Congress as Article One, Section Eight, Enumerated Powers, with an eye to the common good, with an eye to what the preamble of the Constitution would refer to as kind of uh, the general welfare, the common defense, and more perfect union, things like that. In Article Two, administrators should also, to the extent possible, be doing their kind of day-to-day -day kind of bureaucratic work with an eye to the common good. And yes, judges should be kind of interpreting the Constitution from an originalist perspective, but ultimately through an analytical prism of the common good, which I root primarily in the preamble well, the Constitution. Um, so it's not, it's not that someone has to, one person has to define it, it's that every actor must necessarily be acting towards that end through their individual spheres of influence. The second question, which is kind of the populist question, um, you know, look, my good friend Roger Kimball um, uh, ha had a great essay on Buckley and populism literally two days ago, actually, at American Greatness, so this question is quite timely. Um, you know, look, I mean, I think, but you know, Buckley obviously being, uh, first of all, kind of the eponymous name of this program, but obviously also kind of like the founder of the modern conservative movement in many ways, if you will. 
You know, look, I don't think that he would have abhorred kind of a lot of this modern popular sentiment. I mean, one of his most famous quips, obviously, as Roger aptly points out in his American Greatness essay, is, of course, kind of the, his famous uh, bon mot that he said up in Harvard about kind of the, how he would rather be governed by the first 2,000 names in the Boston, Massachusetts phone book than the 2,000 members of, in the Harvard faculty lounge. That is a very, very, very populist sentiment. You know, I think kind of uh, some, some level of populism, some level of kind of, uh, you know, skepticism or even kind of outright hostility to elites is very much ingrained in the DNA. You know, Dan has properly signed the Declaration of Independence, which I also love. I'm born on Abraham Lincoln's birthday. No one worshiped the Declaration more than Abraham Lincoln. But if you kind of go back to that sentiment, well, they were deeply populist insofar as they were trying to kind of rally the masses against authority, against, against uh, King George III. So I think some level of populism has kind of always been there, especially in, kind of in, in modern American conservatism. I mean, what is God and man in Yale, if not kind of a populist, anti-elitist manifesto? I think, it, I think it is absolutely that. And when I'm kind of saying that people should be pursuing the common good within their spheres of influence, what I'm saying is that they should do so in a way that is ultimately getting at kind of the health of the whole in kind of a solidaristic fashion. And I think kind of that interpretive prism necessarily will disproportionately redound to the interests of kind of lower middle class folks more than an emphasis on kind of limousine, Upper West Side, New York Times reading liberalism. I, think, I mean, I think kind of the left-right liberal consensus, if you kind of look at it, kind of, kind of this neoliberal consensus of economic liberalization coupled with cultural deregulation, it's worked out extremely well for the upper rungs of society, for the Davos class, the class that is, that is posting on Facebook with their, with, with their masks saying, you know, uh, do all of our part to stop the spread, they get to work from home. The lawyers, bankers, the journos, I, I get to work from home, okay? It's nice to be kind of in the upper rungs of society. It's not so nice for the people that have to actually go in to work who were kind of who got out of jobs from kind of this performative virtue signaling. So I think kind of a common good lens necessarily does disproportionately redound on the side of kind of the more populist sentiment. So I think those two things kind of work in harmonious fashion. Um, to your third question, if I remember correctly, the one about social pathologies. So look, you know, Charles Murray had this great book, um, you know, uh, coming, coming Apart. Um, with kind of a really kind of detailed look at kind of the unraveling of places like Pennsylvania, Ohio, folks. And then he kind of ultimately concludes towards the end of his essay that, you know, it's basically kind of just their fault. I mean, they kind of need to like culturally better themselves. Uh, J.D. Ban JD Vance, excuse me, and, and Hillbilly Elegy does something somewhat similar, although he, I think, properly has had a bit of a change of heart since then. He kind of now talks about kind of political economy a bit more than he did when he wrote that book. Um, you know, look, I, certainly some of that is true, obviously. I mean, like, obviously a lot of this is kind of a, a, a cultural issue, but there is absolutely, I think, more that government can and should be doing. You know, look, I was in Budapest, Hungary two months ago. I spent time with Prime Minister Orban. I, I am one of those guys you hear about who is <laughs> looking to places like Hungary and Prime Minister Orban in terms of what they're doing for family policy. They have, been, they, 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 they have been able to directly incentivize child rearing. They have raised their total fertility rate, not astronomically, but they have been able to raise it. I think the government should be getting involved in things like that to actually more directly legislate on behalf of working moms and pops, on behalf of, of, of families, and, th and things of that nature there. Um, and and th there definitely is a role for political economy to play here. It's not exclusively kind of a, a cultural phenomenon. And more fundamentally, again, if we're kind of getting to the question of what it means to be a conservative, um, you know, a lot of kind of the, the trends in political economy, I think, did kind of undermine the working man. So one good example here is private sector unionization. There's no obvious reason to me that conservatives should be so manifestly opposed, in theory, to private sector unions. Obviously, kind of in, in the pragmatic reality we live in, you know, the AFL, uh, you know, all the, all the major unions are total democratic donors who hate our guts and probably want us in gulag. So I'm not suggesting that we, that we should go and support them. But in theory, on kind of like a political theory and economic theory chalkboard, you can literally go back to the writings of Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill. I mean, paradigmatic classical liberals. They saw nothing wrong whatsoever with the idea of kind of collective bargaining for private sector workers. Public sector, obviously, totally different ballgame. I'm not going to get into that. But uh, yeah, I do think that there was a role for political economy to play here, for sure. Uh, so, Dan, you uh, eloquently quoted the first two paragraphs, I believe, of the Declaration. Um, but of course, the, uh, the uh, document does not end there, right? And uh, most of the document is actually a practical listing of the specific grievances um, uh, the Americans faced by, um, particularly the British Parliament, not even King George, but the British Parliament itself. And we're familiar with this from our high school history classes. Um, if you interpret that entire document, the Declaration, then, to what extent then should we lean on into order uh, liberty, order liberty um, as a guiding uh, lodestar, as opposed to a more pre as a more historically informed, conscious um, adoption of those pre-American 
roots of our American heritage, which uh, certainly, adopt, uh, certainly embraced elements of commercial liberty, uh, but also these more historical elements, I think, that uh, Josh is suggesting should uh, be elevated uh, when we understand a proper uh, conception of conservatism. Um, and in terms of process, right, process, of course, is important. Uh, then can you specifically address, this is probably the key criticism of this process proceduralist argument, um, which I think sometimes is unfairly cast, right, uh, uh, for, um, uh, uh, for those critics of national um, common good conservatism. But um, does process, I think we've written about this before, but enlighten us, does process and procedure ultimately is it not neutral, but does trend toward progressive beliefs, presuppositions, sort of Amari's uh, um, drag queen uh, famous uh, uh, anecdote. Um, is that argument persuasive? Or does the seemingly procedural neutral um, uh, 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 method tend to favor both perspectives, one more than the other? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it's good questions. I mean, I think there's a couple things to unpack here again. Uh, you know, the Declaration, first of all, of course, is a legal matter. The Declaration does one and only one thing, which is that it declares the United States an independent sovereign nation. The rest of it is all just argument. Uh, and But even then, if you look at those arguments, I think a good deal of the arguments uh, that are made in the Declaration, the grievances with the Crown, uh, some of those are about representation, but many of them are about invasions of individual rights. Um, you know, the, the in particularly uh, abuses of essentially the criminal process uh, against the colonists. Um, so I, I think that, you know, that there is more to it there, but, you know, the Declaration as an idea, I think the, the, that first sentence uh, is the part of it that, that carries particular weight in our politics. And again, I think we need to think about, you know, what is the language of American politics? I think that language is one in which liberty and the Declaration have played a continually important role and one that still resonates today. And, and, and whereas I think that the, the concept of the common good is maybe uh, at such a high level of generality that it doesn't always, you know, I'm not sure it really, it really means very much to uh, the ordinary citizen uh, when, when you phrase it simply as, well, the common good, which is what? It's good and it's common. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and as to the question of process, and I think that relates to the question of who decides these things. I mean, I think Josh kind of waves away the idea that, that um, you know, that, 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 that we should focus on, you know, all the actors in the system should be pursuing a vision of the common good, which doesn't really answer what the common good is. But, you know, I think process rules about who decides things really are, I mean, process rules are not neutral in the sense that, that who decides matters a lot to how things get decided, right? And so all of the different parts of our conservative idea of process, our American idea of process, are oriented towards striking a balance between elites and populists, uh, striking a balance that that works in favor of liberty by, uh, you know, both by, it works in favor of the commonness of the vision of the common good by involving the greatest number of people in the making of decisions, but also sort of, you know, making the government move more slowly. I mean, I think that, that you know, if you look at the, each of the pieces work together, right? I mean, we have democracy, which involves the largest number of people in the making of decisions. We have tradition, which involve, which brings in not only the people alive, but the people, the trial and error of people in the past. Um, we have written law, right? So that we don't simply have, we were the first nation in history that gave the government a rule book it had to follow, not only to protection of individual rights, but the distribution of powers. We don't simply have a purely common law system of justice in which judges decide what is the good. They are bound by the written rules. Um, we have free markets, and free markets are simply, you know, the democracy of economics, essentially. The, the, the decisions of the greatest number of people uh, in, their, in their purchasing decisions, in how they allocate capital, in how they allocate labor, uh, and, and even the free movement of people within the country, all of that is, is the distribution of decision-making power to the largest number of people so that you get a, a vision of the good that is arrived at collectively um, and that is and power is distributed enough locally uh, that people in different areas who have different ideas can pursue those. I mean, I, I don't think that, that our process, I don't think our system should be neutral. 
as to, you know, between truth and, and falsehood, between right and wrong, but I think it has to have enough play in the joints that we not only bring the largest number of people into deciding what the good is, but we also give space for people to live, uh, you know, a different kinds of pursuits of happiness. Um, and, and look, I mean, I think the example of, of Orban's Hungary, uh, you know, I think it is admirable that, that Orban is trying to promote uh, you know, the growth of families. I don't know that he's been terribly successful at that, actually, uh, compared to some of his neighbors. But, you know, the biggest thing that has held uh, the Hungarian state back is a lack of economic liberty, uh, that the economy there simply isn't, uh, you know, is not as strong as ours. Um, you know, and, and again, I mean, if you look at unions, uh, the question of unions, uh, you know, unionization as a voluntary choice is perfectly fine in the private sector, although I think it is a little strange to talk about unions in theory as separate from the unions that actually exist and the elites, you know, the, the union elites who actually run them. I don't think that's really any different from talking about our universities or our newspapers. Um, you know, uh, or or uh, or our social media companies, uh, totally in isolation from who actually runs them. Um, so you know, it, it, it seems to me at, at all of these levels, the you know we distribute power and in order to promote liberty, but also to promote the largest number of people having an input into what the common good is. Um, thank you guys both for the debate. It was very interesting, uh, of course, a very important topic for conservatives today. This question is more for the gentleman on the affirmative. Um, I may be misunderstanding. But it seems under the gentleman's framework that President FDR may be the best president ever. Is this false? If so, where am I misunderstanding? Um, so I, I, I realize that, you, that you, you think this is probably a pretty cute gotcha question, right? Um, so FDR pursued his own vision of the common good according to his own pre-existing analytical frameworks. Um, he was very successful at doing so. Um, I would argue that the best president ever is Abraham Lincoln, who pursued his vision of the common good and kind of a more kind of unified, solidaristic notion, and who, by the way, erred on the side of substantive justice and substantive truth over and over and over again, over kind of an overly rigid procedural form of liberalism, as encapsulated by his, by his speech after the Dred Scott decision, his first inaugural address, where he famously said that he would not enforce the Dred Scott decision as it, as it pertains to any party other than to Mr. Scott himself, because it was an, an egregious act he kind of shepherded through in 1862, Congress passing through, um, you, you know, the issuing passports to slaves in the Western territories in direct contravention of Dred Scott. So he was pursuing a, a substantively correct vision of the common good, which of course is rooted, as Dan would be the first to tell you, in the equality uh, statements in the Declaration. I would source that, by the way, most foundationally in Genesis 127. I mean, it's nice the Declaration says it, but we kind of already knew that that was true. Um, so uh, yeah, look, I think FDR was very successful pursuing his vision of the common good, um, but his substantive vision of the common good is certainly not mine. I think that he was procedurally effective at doing so in very kind of rigid fashion. But it was a nice, cute, gotcha question. I was going to follow that up somewhat with like, the gentleman in the affirmative agreed that there's like an objective sort of vision of the common good and he talked about in his speech about how like each sort of like politician and judges in their own sphere should be deciding the common good. How do we sort of like rectify what feels, at least to me, if I'm understanding right, like a paradox. How is there supposed to be both like an objective good and we're kind of just like okay with everyone pursuing their own version of it? What is the alternative? Isn't this the, the other alternative? The alternative is like the strongest foreign version of a values neutral liberalism, in which my interlocutor has even conceded is a lie. Yeah. Right? Um, so like that doesn't exist. Like, like, like that literally does not exist. Like maybe in like some like political science class that someone took in middle school or high school, they have told you that like a true, true, true values neutral public square, a true, true, true values neutral economy, a true, true, true values neutral constitutional order, a true, true, true values neutral Hollywood, big tech, Wall Street, corporate, fight, fortune 500, BS. It's a lie. And this is the fundamental, this is literally, I think, the dividing line of this debate. 
Okay? The point is that quote unquote American conservatives for the past 67 years have been fighting repeatedly with one hand tied behind their back because of this overly liberalized notion of what it means to actually suggest an affirmative vision of what they actually believe in in the public square. They have at best, at best, I think, fought to a draw on some contested issues. We have, we have successfully, for now, fought to a draw on religious liberty. Uh, re religious liberty jurisprudence on the Supreme Court is not in a terrible place. It is not in a great place, but it is definitely not in a terrible place. That is probably the best that we can do. But over and over and over again, we have completely v vanquished, or, or we have abandoned, I should say, the very notion of firmly putting our values in the public square. What has that resulted in? It has resulted, of course, in this Gramscian march through the institutions, which we see over and over and over again. My friend Chris Rufo is doing yeoman's work on a daily basis to expose the moral and ethical rot that is happening in classrooms and boardrooms all across America. And that has happened, not unilaterally, but at least due in large part to the fact that half the country has been told repeatedly that they can't so much as, as put a thumb on the scale as far as their vision of the good. The left comes in with their dystopian vision of the good, and, then they're, and they're very good at it, obviously. So. Um, I kind of forgot your question, honestly, but I can just end that there. This is a question for Dan. So and the interesting thing about the American founding is there were some people that were way more moralizing than others when it started. Like we have the Puritan tradition, and then we have the Southern tradition. Uh, very different people. How do you think that you determine which one we're drawing from more today? And it seems that at certain points in history, we may have drawn from others in differing degrees. And is there one that we should be oriented towards more? Should we be oriented more towards like this public square where everyone is holding each other morally accountable? Or should we be heading more in a direction, not necessarily of like the slaveocracy, but one where we are taking in as many different uh, and being tolerant of as many different dissenting perspectives as possible? I mean, I think, I mean, first of all, you get to an important point about the founding, which is that the founders didn't all agree with each other either. Uh, so we've been having these arguments about what exactly the good is, what exactly the right is, um, you know, all the way since the beginning. Um, I mean, I do think that, that the, uh, you know, the, the difficulty of getting people into agreement is why we have to have a certain, a certain amount of kind of neutral values arguments, not only for the rule of law, right? We had John Adams in the Massachusetts Constitution talking about, you know, the, the, that we be a government of laws, not of men. Uh, and that means a single rule of law for everyone. But I think even on cultural things, I think we do have to promote, uh, you know, a space for tolerance and, and disagreement. And I think that, that the, uh, the promotion of the common good, of, of any vision of the common good, uh, you know, a, a vision of the moral good certainly is something that, that conservatives should be promoting, but, um, but I think that it always has to be balanced with that sense of pluralism that we have in the society and that, that um, you know, and I think that, that, look, I think if you look at, at the stuff that, you know, Josh references uh, a lot of what uh, Chris Rufo is doing in public education and stuff, you know, a lot of that is, is because it, 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 it is finally making a difference, in part because the work is being done to expose it, but in part because people have moved from a situation where they felt that, um, you know, that there was one vision being promoted uh, that maybe they didn't totally agree with, to a sense that their own, you know, that their own rights and liberties were being trampled upon, right? That 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 there that a climate of intolerance was building, and so I think the the you know I, I think the overreach. That you get uh, from from intolerance that attacks, you know, uh, any pretense of neutrality. I think that's that's something where where conservatives have an opportunity to fight back. And I think, but I think that the opportunity to fight back and present even our own moral vision does depend in part on being able to appeal to these ideas of liberty and neutrality. Uh, in in some extent, to say, look, the other guy is is. You know he's crossing those lines. Uh, you know part of the reason part of the reason FDR's opponents were unsuccessful um, is that I think they you know they were not able to make the case uh, effectively as they should have been that 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 those that there were lines that shouldn't be crossed. Uh, and when they did when they were successful at fighting him at some turns, you know in like the court packing fight, uh, it was because of those those neutral lines. It wasn't because. You know the Senate Democrats and the Democratic-run newspapers decided that um, FDR wanted 
bad things from the Supreme Court. They liked the stuff that he wanted from the Supreme Court, but they recognized that there were certain neutral principles of governance that, that he had violated, that he had trampled on. Thank you. Uh, my question is mostly for the, the gentleman in the negative. Um, you seem rather content to allow for perhaps the free market to provide the majority of the solutions in place of bureaucrats, judges, uh, political representatives. Um, but how does one necessarily regulate against market externalities in terms of, of output uh, of culture, right? Um, if conservatism is the, the ultimate form of, of moral good and will provide for the existence of liberty, how does one answer that the largest sort of giants in, in corporate uh, media, entertainment, uh, banking, et cetera, are all necessarily progressive or, or leftist giants? How does, how does one necessarily work against that? I mean, look, I think the, you know, the, the, the battle is ultimately joined in trying to provide alternatives. I mean, I, I, I think a lot of the, you know, a lot of, a lot of these fights are about the fact that, um, that some of these large corporations are not listening to their own customers. Uh, they're not listening to, uh, sometimes to their own shareholders. And so, you know, I think there are, there are fights that, that can be had uh, you know, on the grounds that they, that they are fundamentally failing. And look, you know, what would be one example of how do you fight this sort of thing? Um, you know, I mean, I think Elon Musk's effort to take over Twitter is a perfect example of using, now he may succeed and he may fail, but it is, is certainly an example of bringing, uh, you know, the forces of, of capitalism to the table to say, wait a minute, you are not delivering the value for your customers or your shareholders that you could be and should be. Um, and so you should lose your position and, uh, you know, the market can decide that. Now that is not, corporate takeovers are obviously a perfect example of an area that is not regulated only by, you know, the pure laissez-faire free market, right? I mean, there's an extensive securities regulation. Uh, there's extensive state corporate law overlay there. But, um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I think the, the the cultural battles do need to be fought, and I think that um, you know that, but but very often uh, behind what appears to be uh, market power is often the government with its thumb on the scales. I mean, if you look at the at woke capital, right, the the banks. Um, I mean, who are the biggest shareholders in that, right? It's the state pension funds. It's, you know, you've got the SEC leaning on them. You've got, there are a lot of governmental forces that are at work that are bending things in that direction. And, and I think that, that using government power, not to bend it back in the other direction, but to remove that, to remove that force uh, is something that is very much within traditional free market conservative uh, theory. Thanks. This question. This is great. Thanks. Uh, this question is also for Josh. Um, so you started off talking about abortion, uh, the border wall, free trade. Um, but I was wondering, wouldn't you have to say that like the the open society, the free trade, the all that that's what's made us all incredibly rich. Even the poor on a global scale are quite wealthy. And also, I'm um, just trying to understand common good conservatism. What what's a proxy issue? That, you would say is like if you believe in this, this is you're probably common good conservative. Um, no, I mean the, the the second is like an interesting question. I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that first. I mean, look, if you reject the lie of pure values neutrality in education and pedagogy, things like that, and then you should want to affirmatively use state power to just outright ban critical race theory and all of its very you know all, all of its various manifestations, right? So it was kind of that four byline New York Times op-ed last summer. I think a Yale professor was one of the four who wrote it. David French was another, and so forth. They basically said, like, because of, we defend liberalism or whatever, like, we're not going to ban this. I mean, if you disagree with that, and you think that there was absolutely a legitimate role to outright ban toxic, you know, civilizational arson from the classrooms, um, then you're probably closer to to my side of the debate. Um, you know, uh, lots of other kind of, uh, you know, if you think that it's kind of you, use kind of, the, the, one, you know, one of the examples that got this entire debate started, you know, three years ago. If you, if you think that the government can outright ban Drag Queen Story Hour from public libraries because it is not kind of an unqualified free speech issue right there, you're probably closer to my side, things like that. Um, I almost forgot your first question, though. Can you just remind me real quick what it was? Sorry, the, the free trade, all 
Oh yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, look. Um, so look, I, I saw. I, I think there's been a misconception here, perhaps, um, based on you, you know, Press's question, this question that I'm like here lies like, like a Marxist or something. Um, look, I majored in economics in college. Okay, I've seen what neoclassical economics looks like on chalkboard. I worked in antitrust research before law school. I went to University of Chicago for law school because of its law and economics curriculum back in the day. Um, I, I am very much a capitalist, but I'm a qualified capitalist. I, you know, as Irving Kristol would have said, I'm a two cheers for capitalism kind of capitalist because I recognize that capitalism, free markets, has been extremely successful and, there, and, and, is, and is fundamentally better than its chief and preeminent rival, of course, which is socialism. But at the same time, unqualified three cheers for, for capitalism style capitalism pursued as an end unto itself, where you are simply and singularly pursuing kind of GDP maximization, you are pursuing kind of efficiency in supply chains, trade, all of that is ends unto itself, you are going to corrode communities. You are going to corrode families. People are going to be displaced. Jobs are going to be ruined. Jobs are going to be outsourced. In the case of supply chains in China, we have literally given China the very rope to hang ourselves as it pertains to kind of supply chains. And you know, the American founders, many of them were very prescient about this. I mean, go back and read kind of Alexander Hamilton's 1791 opinion on or his report on manufacturers. He basically saw all of this coming, and a lot of them did. So, you know, Ecclesiastes says there's, there's nothing new under the sun. And that's really kind of all my side of the debate is trying to do is trying to recover kind of this older kind of more Hamiltonian vision of American political economy. But it, I, I, I'm very much a capitalist, but like Irving Christ, like two cheers for capitalism style capitalists. I thank you for those questions. Now we'll um, go to closing statements. Two minutes for each. We'll start with um, Josh. And please do try to keep it two minutes, Rondos. Yeah. Um, OK, so look, I think we've said most of you know what uh, can or should be said here. I guess my, again, my basic argument, and what I really think this, this boils down to is not what I was just talking about here, but, but um, the last time I talked before that, I guess, which was my basic contention is that the post-war conservative movement has fundamentally tied one hand behind its back, whether it's in terms of political economy, whether it's in kind of the cultural social sphere, whether it, of course, is in the sphere of constitutional interpretation and jurisprudence more generally. And we have done so because we have fetishized procedure, process, and, and kind of this pristine kind of ivory tower goal that does not exist in the real world of kind of a values-neutral liberalism. We have kind of entrusted that as kind of the lodestar for, or for, for all that we believe in. But in so doing, the left has not played nice. They have not followed by the rules. And of course, they haven't, because they never would have. It was, it was kind of a ridiculous notion in the first place. But I do think that you kind of trace this back to kind of the original kind of fusionist consensus that kind of got all this kind of National Review, heritage kind of style Buckley, Reagan liberalism, or right, right liberalism kind of conservatism started. You know, I, I mean, Meyer himself, Frank Meyer, famously said that, you know, I mean, I, when, when he wrote his book or his treatise about fusionism, the fusionism, the, the social cultural components that he was getting at was to be private within the home. It was kind of this notion that in, the, that in kind of the enlightenment marketplace of ideas that our cultures and values would prevail over time. But the idea here was that there was no kind of proper public facing role for values injection. And in that sense, it was kind of fundamentally liberal. And I think that's really kind of done drastic harm. From my perspective, it is no accident that you know after the Engel versus Vitel Supreme Court case in the 1960s, which removed the Bibles from the classroom, now only kind of 60 years later, we can't even tell you how many genders there are. It's right there in Genesis 127, by the way. There's two of them. Um, you know, to me, these are, these are no accidents. And we have done so, again, by kind of fetishizing kind of this values neutrality and just entrusting that kind of you know, the moral arc of history will bend towards our values. It's nonsense, and whether I think it's political economy, constitutional interpretation, or anything else in the public square, it is wholly appropriate, just, it is directly responsive to the magnitude of the, of, of the morass that we're in right now to act with a thumb on the scale towards our eternal values. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll start with a, a point of privilege here on the Josh's answer to the, the, the last question about, uh, you know, about whether or not we can ban uh, untrue ideas uh, from the classroom. And I think the answer is that, that uh, and, and I'll tie this in in a second, that, that you know, when a public school teacher stands up in front of an elementary school classroom or a high school classroom, that is an agent of the state, a paid agent to the state in, on government property, uh, proposing an orthodoxy to children, to a captive audience of children. I don't think there's any need for us to pretend, uh, you know, I don't think that, that value neutrality of any kind requires us to pretend that, that uh, you know, that, that we have no, nothing to say of, for that. That is exactly the sort of thing that the democratic process should supervise. And in fact, I think a lot of the problem with public education uh, is a lack of uh, proper democratic supervision. Um, but that gets us back to the question of who decides things. Um, and, and, you know, rules and order, rules and liberty 
go together because ultimately, um, you know, as conservatives, we are the people who believe in rules. We do, and, and we are able to promote our vision of society in large part by showing that we are the people who, who recognize pluralism, who recognize the value of rules, um, and who recognize the importance of democratic input into the, into the making of decisions. So, um, you know, it's not, it's not a, there's not some, this is not an idea that there's a pie in the sky, perfect neutrality, or, you know, a frictionless universe. Uh, it is a recognition that, um, you know, that, that individual liberty matters, that rules and order matter, in, including their, their ability to be neutral and fair uh, to everyone in society. And, you know, it's not fighting with one hand behind your back to be the grown-ups. Uh, in the room, to be the people who recognize that, that law matters, um, that how we make decisions matter, um, and that, that liberty, economic liberty matters uh, every bit as much as, uh, you know, as, as other kinds of liberty, because that is what gives you the power as an individual to, to do your own thing with your own family. And with that, we'll close today's debate. Thank you, Professor Collins, Mr. Hammer, Mr. McLaughlin, for joining us. And a special thanks to Professor Vallis for, for serving as our faculty sponsor. Thank you, everyone.